different sites, so I'm a little a little backwards here this morning. So thank you all. Um, so uh, Ginger. Yes, ma'am. You could have all. No, I'll, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started now and then I'll do okay. I'll do roll and then I'll hand it over to you. OK, great. Thanks. All right. All right. Welcome, everyone, to um, the July uh, statewide adult committee. My name's Kirby Fye. I'm with the department. Thank you all for being so flexible this morning. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I'm uh, just have a few things that I need to go over. Uh, per the Open Meetings Act, this meeting will be uh, recorded and it will be posted to the department website within the next day or two. Uh, the committee decided to continue to hold this meeting virtually just to keep everyone safe uh, with COVID. So um, we'll we'll reassess each um, each quarter to determine uh, when we'll meet again in person because uh, we always had the option before where we can meet with the department, um, but we're not doing that at this time just for safety purposes. Um, with it being recorded, please also state your name uh, before asking any questions or presenting. It's just helpful with the minutes. And if you could also make sure that your phone or your computer is muted if you're not speaking, just to prevent any feedback from coming through. I'm going to go ahead and go through roll. I think I've been keeping up with it as um, individuals entered the room. So I'm going to go through roll. If I've missed your name at the end, please let me know. I have Lisa Helton on the line. I have Vonda Wagner. I have, hold on, I just lost my, just lost that. I have Rebecca Provost Emmons. I have Trish Cunningham. Samantha Slagle, Debbie Hillen, Allison White, Evelyn Jurgen, Avis Easley, Kurt Hippel, Jan Cagle, Paul Fuchkar, Elisa Lapolt, Patrick Starnes, and Jeff Layden. Have I missed anyone? All right, Ginger, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kirby. And um, it's great to hear your voice. And it's great to hear Avis's voice. And I'm guessing Amy's on that end. So it's um, great to hear, hear from you guys. Um, hopefully we can um, move to an in-person meeting soon. But here we are um, again on the phone or on video. Um, I appreciate everybody joining. I know this is a minute out of your day, but I think um, hearing from folks and hearing what's going on across the state um, with the department and other um, other support groups and networks is really important to help us as we move towards um, again starting a needs assessment. Um, I want to get that in people's minds right away because uh, we'll be talking about that um, maybe this meeting but moving forward in other meetings um, I think it helped for us to talk about it more frequently as we got ready to get that ready for April so um, thank you all for being here and um, I think we'll just turn it over is Miss Hilton ready to be our first speaker um, <coughs> I, I am Kirby. yes okay. hi, hi Lisa. <laughs> Lisa do you want me to share your presentation or do you want to share it um, I'm not on Teams. I'm oh. in the field on site visits, so I'm just on my phone. Um, I should have so realized you know, that. <laughs> I'm going to share it for you. Just tell me um, as, as you go through. Um, okay, if you'll let me know um, when it's up, then and when you're ready for me to begin, I'll I'll try to. All right, we're ready. Okay. Uh, good morning again. My name is Lisa Helton. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Community Supervision for the Department of Corrections. Um, community Supervision is uh, probation and parole supervision in the community. Um, we'll go to the second slide, which just briefly um, is our mission, vision, and guiding principles. Our mission is very simple, providing safe and secure prison and 
prisons and effective community supervision, essentially to enhance public safety, which is the uh, entire focus of the agency. I thought before we got into the criminal justice reform initiatives that I would just give a brief overview of community supervision um, to give context to folks who may not be familiar with the supervision. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, slide four. I'll try to remember that. Um, slide four just gives a little bit of information, demographic information about the number of staff we have, as well as the, the population that we supervise. Um, probation, as many people know, um, are those individuals who are released by the court um, to supervision without any imprisonment. They're subject to conditions imposed by the court. Um, community corrections is, a, is actually a statutory sentence um, that was initially developed as a last alternative to incarceration. It's designed to divert felony offenders from prison while providing and then parole, finally, is those who are released from incarceration to supervision by the Board of Parole prior to the execution of their subject to conditions by the Board of Parole. So as you can see, as the commissioner often says, really control our parole. Um, both prisons and communities come to us from other folks. Um, slide five is just um, a quick look at where we are across the state. We have 15 district offices, um, 29 field offices, 18 community offices, and the community corrections offices, those are uh, grantee, contract grantee agencies. They are not state employees, um, but are procured through an RFP. And then we have six day reports now and in this most recent budget we have a budget allocation for two new DRC day reporting centers which will be in Murray and Hamilton County. The one in Murray County will also service um, Lawrence and um, Williamson County as well. So slide six um, just gives a, an overview of sort of the, the foundation for supervision uh, of probationers and parolees. Uh, the risk principle uh, is the best practice, best practice for corrections. It has long been, it's a long-standing uh, practice that is, um, is steeped in research. It's been shown to effectively reduce recidivism by as much as 75% of certain settings. And so sort of in a nutshell, uh, risk refers to the probability of reoffending. Uh, needs reflect the dynamic factors that drive involvement in offending, and so factors such as personality patterns, pro criminal attitudes, substance abuse, those kinds of things. And then responsivity ensures that the treatments are responsive to the risk and needs of the the offender. Um, in our world, the general responsivity calls for the use of cognitive behavioral approaches. Um, to treatment, which has been shown to be most effective with offenders generally. So the risk principle in a supervision context tells us that we need to have the highest level of offender-officer interaction with high to moderate risk offenders. So those high risk offenders should be prioritized for more structured, intensive treatment, um, they should receive more programming for a longer period of time to reduce their risk of reoffending. Um, and they should be, for instance, reporting more frequently, having more officer uh, interactions. The low risk individuals should be prioritized only when they have high criminogenic needs. Otherwise, they should have a more minimal um, supervision standards in terms of compliance, uh, officer interactions, those kinds of things. The research demonstrates that a, supervising a low risk offender at the same level as a high risk offender actually serves to increase their recidivism versus reduce it. And that's a little bit of a, a challenge for some folks to understand who sort of um, want to use a one size fits all approach, but as everyone on this call knows, um, you know, individuals are different, and so they need a different approach to um, their supervision 
that needs to look at who they are, what their needs are, what the factors are in their lives. And so that, that's the approach that um, PDOC takes. We began using the strong R as a validated risk and needs assessment tool in 2017, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, but um, it's administered at the time of intake and annually, uh, as well as in the prisons, just prior to reentry and then at any major milestones. And so a validated risk and needs assessment also is fundamental to the risk principle, obviously, because it is what identifies both the risks and needs from which we determine a supervision level as well as a case management plan for probationers and parolees. And then, I'm sorry, I'm so bad about telling you about the slides. Slide seven will go into criminal justice reform with slide eight. Um, so just to give a little background with the criminal justice reform that occurred in this last legislative session, in 2016, the Public Safety Act of 2016 mandated the use of a single validated risk and needs assessment across the system in, in Tennessee. And as I mentioned um, a second ago, that is the strong R or the static risk offender needs guide revised assessment. And that is used in the prison facilities. It is used in probation, parole, and community corrections. And um, we are, it is used prior to parole release and um, will be used more uh, in the jail going forward. Um, the PSA, the Public Safety Act of 2016, also required the use of a graduated system of administrative sanctions. Um, again, research demonstrates that the use of sanctions and incentives um, is effective in returning a probationer or parolee to compliance with conditions of supervision. And so sanctions are not applied um, when someone has a new criminal charge. They are applied when there are what is referred to as technical violations or violations of the conditions of supervision. And so Sanctions need to be swift, certain, and proportionate. Um, we developed a graduated system of sanctions, which is, again, in line with, the, with research and best practice, um, that involves looking at a person's supervision level, at the type of uh, behavior violation they had, as well as where they are in the sanction system. In other words, how many times have they been sanctioned and were previous sanctions successful. So all of those things go into our sanction system. We have a, a matrix um, that is used uh, for that, again, as a best practice. And we have seen good success with, again, returning people to compliance rather than uh, violating them, taking them back to court uh, and violating them for things such as failure to report, um, or a positive drug screen, the sanction system allows us to return them to compliance, um, again, with, a, with a, a high level of success at this point. Now, that is something, the sanction system yes. um, is something that we are working on and continue to look at in terms specifically for um, drug addicted, drug dependent offenders recognizing um, that the driver sometimes for noncompliance with someone with addiction is a different uh, is different from just um, straight noncompliance and so we have been we've been working on that to um, to sort of look at that differently for the day reporting centers um, which uh, is a program for um, folks who have addiction issues and mental health issues. And so that sanction system is, is sort of always under review um, in order to make it the best and most responsive and appropriate system that we can have here. So that is sort of the backdrop to where we were in this year's legislative session. And so we can go to slide nine, <clears throat> which is, um, the criminal justice reform from 2021. And there were two, for us, two primary um, acts 
Um, the first is the Alternative to Incarceration uh, Act. And, and that, um, as some of you may have heard, there was a fair amount of discussion about that because there, was a, there is a focus on emphasizing the use of community-based alternatives to incarceration. And so the idea being that, um, particularly for people who are in need of treatment, who may not be high risk, but um, who are really engaged in criminal behavior primarily because of addiction or mental health issues, um, that Tennessee should look to expand alternatives to incarceration in that area. And so um, that was the emphasis of a large part of that legislation. Um, encouraging um, sort of the use of day reporting centers and other treatment options. Um, there, there is, there's some language in there about community corrections. Community corrections historically has been, has had a strong programmatic and treatment um, component to it. Um, and I think the idea is to really emphasize those options where we have them, particularly in the rural areas. The legislation also prohibits probation revocations based on one instance of a technical violation. So for instance, if you have someone who has one positive drug screen, um, instead of having a violation um, where the person has their sentence put into effect because they had a positive drug screen as a result of addiction, um, it prohibits that and um, as long as the act there's not a new felony, a new class A misdemeanor, or it isn't a zero tolerance violation in the sanction system, which, um, for instance, meth, a positive meth, is a zero tolerance violation in the sanction system. Um, the act also instituted probation sentence caps from um, 10 to 8 years um, so that um, a person you know, now you can have a four-year sentence. As a matter of fact, I was talking about uh, talking about a case yesterday where somebody got a four-year sentence in 2011 and was still on probation up until yesterday um, when the sentence, when the judge um, terminated the sentence. And so, you know, I think this is designed to keep that from happening um, and to try to help folks who get a probation sentence to get the, the treatment or the programming, um, the assistance or support resources that they need during a defined period of time. Um, this legislation also imposes revocation limitations for technical violations, and that's for technical only violations. So when you don't, again, have a new felony, a new class A misdemeanor. Um, and again, instead of having a violation where the sentence is put into effect for probation, um, there are limitations. And so if you have a te technical violations and failure to report, again, positive drug screens, there's a limitation. So the first, you can see them laid out on the slide, 15 days, 30 days, 90 days, and then the remainder of the sentence for the fourth and subsequent um, revocation. So again, I think Part of the idea is to follow best practice, follow the research, and to recognize that technical violations are not new criminal behaviors. And the uh, sort of motivation or the issues underlying those non-compliant behaviors with conditions should be addressed um, through alternatives to incarceration where possible. And slide 10. Um, is the Reentry Success Act of 2021, uh, and it primarily um, focuses on parole-related issues for us. And so, um, again, as you can see in the first bullet, uh, up until this act, um, the most recent legislation allowed the Board of Parole to uh, deny parole and put set the next hearing opportunity at 10 years. And this changes it to six years. So a person can wait no longer than six years to have a parole hearing, assuming they're eligible. 
Um, it also imposes the same revocation limitations for technical violations as the uh, Alternative to Incarceration Act does for probation. Um, this act includes legislation for presumptive relief for, um, for those inmates who are serving a sentence for a Class E or Class D felony, um, or if they're serving a sentence for a felony that's not classified as a violent, violent offense under the law. So if the, the person is considered eligible, um, if they're in that category, if they are determined to be low risk to reoffend, um, they, they, based on their validated risk and needs assessment, uh, they should be presumed eligible for relief. Um, if they've completed programming rec recommended by the department based on the risk and needs assessment, um, or if they can complete that program while they're on supervision in the community. Um, there are also some, some limitations for eligibility related to um, class A and B disciplinary, um, if they've received that while incarcerated within one year of the hearing, um, they cannot have been convicted of violent sex, sexual offense, a sexual offense or a sex offense, depending upon the um, definition in the legislation. So um, again, that looks at sort of these low risk offenders who can be supervised in the, in the community and may benefit from community services in terms of reentry. Uh, more so than incarceration. Um, then there is also there. There's also some language in there about um, the board of parole and when they can use seriousness of of the offense as a reason for denying parole. There, there's some language that um, sort of builds the fence around that as well. That legislation also includes some stipends for uh, county jails that follow evidence-based practices. So jails that incorporate programming and evidence-based programming and treatment models um, can receive additional stipends for, uh, for, for their jail. Uh, slide 11. Um, the uh, imposes the the Reentry Success Act imposes mandatory supervision as well, um, and that is very new for um, for Tennessee. Uh, but with mandatory supervision, all eligible inmates will be released on mandatory supervision one year prior to their sentence expiration date, um, and then if they're not eligible uh, for parole one year prior to uh, upon reaching the red date or the release eligibility date. So those folks will come out, will be under supervision for a year, giving them the opportunity to get support. There again is research to show that um, people who come out under supervision um, can be more successful in the community. And I think there are many reasons for that. Um, there's a lot of research that shows that first 90 to 120 days upon release is a critical time as people readjust to the community. Um, Long-term inmates certainly need uh, support in a system because there have been assistance because there have been so many changes. Uh, so the idea is that you better position people to be successful and not to return to prison uh, by having the mandatory supervision. And we can go to slide 12. Um, it's just the intro slide for slide 13. So we can go to slide 13, which is really about um, initiatives that are related to criminal justice reform and, and sort of the recognition of where there are some gaps uh, in Tennessee. Obviously, um, um, I think that everyone um, on this committee is probably familiar with, with some of these initiatives already. And I know that there's some folks um, on this call or on the, in this meeting who are also involved in some of these initiatives. So everyone's welcome to weigh in where you like. Um, Treatment-oriented caseload is <clears throat> something that we are exploring and are going to move to. We're um, going to pilot 
treatment oriented caseloads. This will be a different supervision model designed specifically for um, those on supervision with addiction um, issues. Our initial pilot uh, will likely target uh, for parolees an area where we have parolees who have completed group therapy or uh, therapeutic community within the prison system and then come out. And for um, probationers who are in the day reporting center and who complete that intensive program and then are coming to regular probation. So our, our premise is based on what we have seen and research in our discussion with um, behavioral, with our behavioral health services team is that um, we just need to have a different approach to those folks. Um, the commissioner is very interested in looking at our options for treatment oriented caseloads that would have very specific training for officers. We would look at the kind of officer. Our standards would likely be different. Um, you know, we have some interest in looking at drug screens differently and, and determining how to incorporate that model into using drug screens as indicators for treatment versus drug screens as indicators uh, for violations. Um, obviously, that has to fall within the context of statutory requirements, but recognizing the, the issues surrounding um, addiction, we believe that having treatment-oriented caseloads will make a difference. As, as I'm sure you can tell, we, our model and everything we do um, is grounded in research and best practices. So we're sort of following that model. Um, I'll skip down to the National Governors Association Technical Assistance um, Award, which we just received. And the treatment-oriented caseload um, is tied to that because one of the things that we in our application ask for assistance with is the development of those treatments oriented caseloads, the development of training for the officers, both training, more intensive training for the officers who would have those caseloads, but general training um, for all of our staff about those issues. So um, as a matter of fact, Rebecca is a member of the team uh, on that NGA Technical Assistance Award and graciously uh, agreed to work with TDSC on that to make sure that, that we have a solid and holistic approach um, to what we're asking for in terms of technical assistance and how we're moving forward with those treatment-oriented caseloads. As I mentioned earlier, we uh, were funded for two additional day reporting centers. Um, and as many of you probably know, um, we have the Community Treatment Collaborative, which is, um, for those who don't, a budget allocation um, interagency agreement with mental health for treatment by licensed community treatment providers. So the way that works for us is a social worker who works for TDOC in the field uh, makes a referral, which ranges from in inpatient, intensive outpatient, residential program, um, minor case management, transportation assistance, a number of things, and then it goes into um, the mental health system and through mental health providers. And that has been um, incredibly beneficial for those folks who need treatment but don't have the ability to provide that for themselves. Um, I believe everyone is likely familiar um, with the Ten Rock program and recovery course. Um, we obviously have officers who are working in those courts, and as that expands, again, we'll continue to um, uh, apply resources to that. As we look at the treatment-oriented caseloads, we also are looking at that model um, and the way we supervise those folks on those caseloads as well. Um, I think I heard that Debbie Hillen was on the call. Um, and she's participating in the Certified Peer Recovery uh, Support Specialist in the community. Um, that is a grant um, with uh, through OCJP and mental health. Uh, well, actually, through mental health provided that. And we appreciate that because um, 
you know, your department reached out to this department, mental health reached out to TDOC to say we've included um, the CPRS three of those positions for a pilot. And um, so that is essentially up and running. We have that in Blount County, which is in Maryville, in our Maryville office, and the Chattanooga office in Hamilton County, and then the Lawrenceburg office in, in Lawrence County through local providers. And um, we had some challenges, um, you know, sort of reconciling missions, uh, I think, with uh, between community agencies and the requirements of supervision. But I believe that we've sort of come together, we've worked that out, and um, are moving forward with that. So we're very anxious to see the impact that that has on our population and the impact that has on successful reentry for them. Um, similarly, we have a two-gen project with, um, again, mental health through OCJP and DCS. And that initiative um, <clears throat> is to provide services to probationers and prolies who have children who are DCS involved. And so that treatment, mm -hmm. that will provide treatment and family reunification strategies um, there. So we've been really, really fortunate um, to have a great collaboration with the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. Um, obviously, these issues, you know, addiction, mental health issues are significant in our population. And uh, the Department of Mental Health is, is obviously the, um, the subject matter expert on that. So uh, TDOC uh, is lucky to have the partnership that we have and, and have uh, the department as a resource, but also <clears throat> as a collaborator and uh, a guide in a lot of these, these areas. <clears throat> And finally, um, Recidivist <clears throat> is a nonprofit um, that is going to support all of these initiatives by um, compiling and uh, presenting um, data in a way that elevates our ability to monitor and analyze key metrics. It's going to give us uh, those in real time um, so, obviously, the goal ultimately is to reduce recidivism, but also to be able to look at technical violations, the population, improve the outcomes. And so, for each of these initiatives, recidivists will be working with us to capture that data and to be able to present it in a way that we can use it in um, an effective way to ultimately um, create more successful discharge and um, fewer people on supervision or in prison. So that concludes my presentation. If anyone has questions, I'll be glad to take those. Um, I appreciate the opportunity, certainly, to share the information, and I'm glad to share any other more detailed information if, any, if anyone needs that. And so, Kirby, that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. This is Ginger, too. Thank you for that thorough presentation. That's um, really enlightened um, me and some definitions about things, and I'm sure other people on the call appreciate um, appreciate the slideshow and, the, and the, the discussion following that. So any questions from anybody real quick? I don't want to sell Rebecca short on some time. Okay, so Kirby, could you introduce Rebecca and, and we'll move forward? Sure. So Rebecca is our new Director of Criminal Justice Services with the Division of Substance Abuse Services. Um, she's been, how many years have you been with us, Rebecca? Uh, about two and a half. Seems like uh, longer, but about two and a half. It does. <laughs> I think all of 2020 is just like a blur, so that year doesn't count. Um, let me pull this, let me pull this up. Uh, 
Thank you, Kirby. And and I want to say, Lisa, thank you. I enjoyed your presentation. And we have not met officially yet, but I have been hearing your name for the last two and a half years. And, and uh, I know Ellen truly enjoyed working with you so much. And I really look forward to, to, to meeting you in person. And I just really appreciate TDOC and the wonderful relationships and collaborations that we have with you guys. Thank you. I feel the same way and I look forward to meeting you in person. <laughs> <laughs> Soon. <laughs> um, well, thank you everyone. Thank you, Kirby, for the introduction. Yes, I've been with the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services for about two and a half years. Uh, previously, I was the Recovery Court Administrator with the Division of Substance Abuse Services. Um, and the majority of my career uh, has been working with recovery courts in some form or fashion uh, in a variety of different ways. So I am excited to be here to share with you guys. Um, Lisa showed me up with her nice thorough presentation. I have one slide, but I am going to talk, <laughs> talk about all the all the points on my slide and I'm happy to share additional information afterwards um, with you all if you have questions. But I am going to talk about the initiatives that are through the Office of Criminal Justice Services. And Lisa touched on a couple of them, which I appreciate, and I'll, I'll expand on those a little bit further. And, and Lisa, I also wanted to say we had a great meeting, NGA meeting yesterday, and I enjoyed meeting uh, some of your team members. So that was very, very fun. Um, I'll start with recovery courts. Uh, Tennessee has chosen, well, our department has chosen to call them recovery courts. Traditionally, they're called drug courts, but we want to focus on the idea of recovery. So in Tennessee, they're called recovery courts, and recovery courts are evidence-based programs. They've been around for over 30 years, um, so there's extensive research to support uh, their outcomes and effectiveness in reducing both uh, criminal behavior and illicit drug use, focusing on nonviolent and high risk, high need offenders. Lisa also touched on the risk need responsivity. You wanna treat the high risk clients with the most intensive services and ensure that you're not over treating the low risk clients. Um, so recovery courts uh, focus on, on those individuals. <laughs> they have to agree to participate that's one of the the key key things about recovery courts a judge cannot order someone to participate in a recovery court that does not agree and show a willingness to participate so unlike supervision you can be ordered to, to or probation you, you are ordered to probation but with recovery court you have to agree to participate um and the majority of them are also on probation so we appreciate tdoc providing that supervision uh as well but it, it encompasses intensive supervision, regular random drug testing, frequent court appearances in front of the judge to review progress. They get rewarded for doing well. Um, and, and then they kind of sometimes have to have a course correction if they're you know not, not uh, doing as well. And I love what Lisa said about using drug screens as indicators for treatment. Uh, recovery courts, you know, if someone's not passing their drug tests, then it's what treatment do you need to help you um, rather than than being punitive um, we have currently 82 recovery courts in tennessee which is amazing um, 50 of those are traditional adult drug courts um, 10 are veterans treatment courts we have nine mental health courts one human trafficking court that's located in davidson county um, six juvenile recovery courts two family treatment courts and four dui courts and in exciting news, we have uh, the first uh, women's residential recovery court that will be opening very soon uh, in Davidson County. Uh, and if you have questions about that, I'm happy to answer what I can. Um, the next chunk of funding that, again, we're so grateful to TDRC for the interagency agreement, but they provide, I'm skipping around, let me back up. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is the uh, aid out and spot funding, which is treatment for uh, individuals 
involved with the criminal justice system that need uh, substance use and or co-occurring disorder treatment. It provides funds to our providers to be able to treat those individuals who do not have any other way uh, to pay for care. So if they're indigent, uh, don't have insurance, um, this fund helps to provide uh, treatment for those offenders. And we are so very grateful for our provider network uh, that we work with to uh, provide those services when these individuals present for treatment. We, our next uh, initiative is the Community Treatment Collaborative. This is our wonderful partnership with TDOC. And this funding allows us to provide uh, forensic social workers that are employed by TDOC and probation officers can make referrals to the forensic social workers when they see a need, uh, whether it be for substance abuse and or co-occurring treatment, co-occurring disorder treatment, if they're on probation, parole, just coming out of jail. Um, and this has just been a wonderful, wonderful collaboration for us. And, um, and again, truly appreciate our partnership with TDOC for this. We also have a criminal justice liaison program. And this is to facilitate communication and coordination among the those justice involved individuals and the behavioral health systems in order to provide treatment, case management, service referral, linkage for those justice involved individuals who need these services. And something exciting about our CGL program is currently, or as of state fiscal year 21, we had uh, we were serving 80 of, of Tennessee's 95 counties and excited. We are excited to have gotten an increase in funding uh, through the governor's budget this year, and we will be expanding the criminal justice liaison program uh, to cover all 95 counties in Tennessee. So we're really, really excited about this. Um, <clears throat> these individuals go into the jail, they do assessments, um, and and they do their best to help offend, help individuals coming out of jail or prison and getting connected with any behavioral health services that they need. Um, so it's it's a it's a really great program, and I know the CJLs stay very busy, uh, and we're grateful for the, the agencies that we partner with um, for that. Another initiative is the Tennessee Recovery Oriented Compliance Strategy. We have we partner with five agencies uh, and provides uh, this in 14 counties in the states. It's a smaller program. Um, it was designed to be a court diversion strategy to serve criminal justice population that, that does not qualify for recovery courts, whether they're not high enough risk um, or perhaps they're a violent offender and they don't meet the other uh, criteria for recovery court. But they are put on a docket and they work closely with uh, a criminal justice liaison and these individuals present before the judge on a regular docket just kind of as a check-in to see how they're doing with, with their treatment. Um, we also uh, have uh, provide DUI school certification um, for those agencies that provide DUI school across the state. And we have uh, a, a handful of discretionary grants, federal grants. Um, we have two from SAMHSA right now. One is to help expand treatment into uh, rural counties. So this was a grant that was written to help expand telehealth treatment prior to COVID. Um, so it was something that we were really able to, to take advantage of when, when we weren't able to meet in person. And um, we also have a SAMHSA grant for a family treatment court, uh, as well as a Bureau of Justice Assistance grant that allows us to provide family-centered services, specific family-centered services to um, five recovery courts across the state. And as uh, we also have one of the grants, and I, I, this one is a lot to talk about, so I will touch on it, but the COPE grant, also known uh, as the uh, COPE COSAP grant, which has allowed us to go out across the state and conduct um, sequential intercept mapping with uh, communities to determine what their gaps are 
for services and, and treating the justice involved population. And we've had a number of initiatives that have come uh, through that grant. Um, one of them, uh, Lisa touched on, was the certified peer um, working closely with the TDOC. So we are excited about that partnership and kind of getting that. Uh, we're, we're just now getting that up off the ground. And so we're, we're excited to see um, how that can be impactful. And I've touched on one of the, the main funding updates for our office, but another uh, funding update that we got this year from the governor's budget was just over $2.6 million to expand residential recovery courts across the state. And just to touch on residential recovery courts briefly, I know I mentioned the women's that's getting ready to open. Uh, the Davidson County uh, Residential Recovery Court, which was started by uh, Judge, Judge Seth Norman, um, has been around for many years. And that was, uh, Ellen Abbott actually worked very closely with Judge Norman uh, as they founded the Morgan County Residential Recovery Court in East Tennessee. Um, both of these programs take individuals from across the state that need a higher level of supervision than um, <clears throat> than a traditional recovery court. So we are the capacity at the the men's in Morgan County is around 100. Um, and then that's men's only the Davidson County Recovery Court accepts both men and women. So they're a little bit different program. And like I said, we're about to, to open the women's residential recovery court program, um, hopefully uh, within the next month and um, really kick that program off and start being able to to treat women and their unique needs uh, in the recovery court. So I could talk all day about what we do. I'm passionate about it and I'm blessed to work for, for the, this department. And uh, I, if anyone has any questions, if I can't answer them, I promise you I'll get back to you on it. I'm still learning a lot of this, but I know people that know things. So if I don't know, I can definitely get to the answer. So thank you, Kirby. Thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, hi, this is Ginger. Thank you, Rebecca. You may have only had one slide, but you sure had a lot to cover on that <laughs> slide. Appreciate that so much. Um, and Lisa, too, thank you once again. Um, I do have um, a couple questions and or comments. Um, the adult committee for the last um, couple years has focused in our needs assessment. Um, we've kind of talked about the need for recovery housing uh, for folks that are um, have um, incarceration history or I'm, I'm not sure of all the right vernacular and y'all are helping us with that. Thank you. But I know that's been a concern um, that's kind of come out of our needs assessment. Could y'all speak to that a little bit and, and kind of help help give us some information or guidance towards that? I can't speak directly to that. That that and Kirby, correct me if you know more than I do on this. But Nehru, with our department, is over uh, the Chi Two initiative from uh, yeah. from our department that is establishing some some housing to treat this population. So I don't want to I don't want to misspeak on his behalf. Um, right. Oh, no. uh, so uh, Ginger. Gonna, as y'all are talking about the strong assessments, I'm wondering how. How does housing build into that as you're trying to help people? Um, of course, mental health word, we say discharged, um, <laughs> as they're being released from um, jail or prison. How how impactful are the housing needs in those recovery plans that you're helping people oh, meet? Sure. No, I, I, I can touch on that a little bit. Um, certainly, housing is just is, is a big deal. Um, recovery courts uh, mention it and bring it up and they're like, I need housing for my clients. And so that that is a piece that they work very closely. That's something that they try to secure in, in you know, whatever fashion. Sometimes it's they go to residential treatment for a while. Um, sometimes they go to residential treatment and transition to housing, uh, you know, sober, supportive housing. Um, so it, it is a need that we see, but we found that with um, with the partners we have across the state, as long as we're having conversation with with what housing is available, that is something that they certainly work to address and ensure that 
folks participating in programming have the most safe, secure housing that, that we can get for them. Thank you. That helped. It kind of helps validate what we're seeing too. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, again, this is Ginger. Did anyone else have any comments or questions for our guest speakers today? Ginger, this is Debbie. Um, hey, Debbie. And Lisa, thank you very much. Uh, and Rebecca, congratulations and welcome. Thank you, uh, Debbie. To, to our insanity. Uh, the speaking regarding housing, um, probably is the largest housing provider uh, that is associated with the department. Um, housing even for me is difficult to find for clients. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ginger, as you talk about the need, and I think I've seen that appear across all uh, uh, planning councils over the years. Uh, there's a lot of housing out there. However, the barrier is having the money up front and to be able to give them a chance to get a job and to go to work. So uh, I know even as my staff looks into trying to find housing for someone, it's you gotta have first a deposit and first and last month's rent. And, and oftentimes the rent that's being charged is um, more than sometimes that they can afford, especially when they're paying probation and court fees and those kind of things. Now, I will tell you, so as a, a clinician, that's where I go. I can tell you on the flip side of that, as a uh, owner of over 650 units of housing scattered across Tennessee, You've got to have, I understand why they stay rigid with what they're doing. They have to be able to cover their expenses. So somewhere there needs to be a discussion regarding the barriers to getting into housing and recognizing that the landlord has financial commitments that they have to meet. And there's a big gap right there. There's those out there with housing that want to provide the housing. But on the other hand, there is the issue of how is this level of service initially going to get paid for? So those are my comments, both from a clinician and from a, a landlord standpoint. Hope that made some sense. This is Ginger. Thank you, Debbie. And, and I took notes and hopefully we can include those in our discussions as we get closer to making our next year needs assessment. You, you said it so beautifully. Thank you. This is Melvin. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> this is Emma. I just wanted to say I'm sorry. I finally figured out how to get on here. But listening to, you know, uh, the conversations about the housing, and because that was always my biggest issue with uh, housing. Hey, Rebecca, it's so good to see where you are. Hi, thank but, you. Um, <laughs> the the thing that kind of got my attention uh, right here at the end was that the housing issue and how it needs to be paid for prior to them getting housing. And when I worked as the liaison uh, between the two systems in that program, uh, the liaison program, there was money in place that if we could help a person get housing as long as they could maintain it, then I could actually do it through that program. So it paid, the, the, got the deposits or the utilities, uh, you know, so forth and so on. So I don't know if that's the case with the liaison program now or not, but that was what helped me. So if I had a gentleman that was coming out of the uh, the jail and he needed housing and didn't have the funds at that point, you know, to pay the deposit, then I would put the request in, get that money, get that check, or either I would set up where the 
person that was going to be uh, allowing them to stay at the house, that they would give me time to get that request in, and they would go ahead and let that person in. So I don't know if that's the case now or not, because that's been, what, five years ago at least. But I <laughs> it just still to is. Add that. Thank you for adding that. Yeah, with our uh, recovery court contracts, as well as our criminal justice liaison contracts, there is money in some of the budgets uh, for uh, needs such as deposit for getting a house or things like that. So we are still, a, we are able to help in that way. It's, it's, it, it could, of course, we always want more money in that line item, but there is, there is still money to be able to assist in that way as much as we can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, this is Ginger again, and I think we're um, just a little over our allotted time. Um, Kirby, was there anything else we needed to cover um, this morning before we sign off? Um, just if anyone joined the call after I took attendance, I have Emma and I have Elliot. Is there anyone else who joined the call after a roll was taken? I think I, I got everyone. Um, and then if you have any um, suggestions for future presentations, we'll meet again in October. Um, just any any topics or presenters you're interested in hearing more about, reach out to um, Ginger, Candice, or I, and we'll be happy to get that set up for you. Lisa and Rebecca, thank you again um, for your presentation and for your service to our community. We really appreciate it. We know how valuable what you do is, and we hope y'all can do a lot more. Thanks. <laughs> thank you so much for the invitation. And I just, just have to say, Emma, it's just so good to hear your voice. It's been so many years. Um, so it's just so good to hear your voice and to connect with you guys on here. and. I look forward to all these in-person things that I hope happen very soon. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all, everybody. And um, thank you, um, Kirby, Avis, and Amy for getting everything set up. And we will um, be sending out minutes soon. And we hope everybody has a great rest of the summer. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Ms. Avis. Thank you.